In the icy depths of Norway's Plura Cave, a team of five experienced cave divers began a thrilling journey. The dive was going smoothly until things took a turn for the worse. Kai Kankinen, one of the divers, tried to assist another diver, but the freezing water and great depth forced him to make the difficult decision to save himself. As he continued swimming, attempting to remain calm, he discovered a teammate's body and observed the fourth diver desperately trying to maneuver around it. Their frantic movements suggested they might soon exhaust themselves and die. With the fifth diver's whereabouts unknown, Kankinen realized the severity of their situation. Just a few hours before, the divers had traveled through Finland, Sweden, and Norway to reach the Jordbru farm near the Plura cave. The team was made up of Kai Kankinen, Patrick Gronkvist, Yari Huterinen, Vesa Rontinen, and Yari Yu, all experienced Finnish divers. Their goal was to make a challenging journey between the two entrances of the Plura cave. The cave's depth, narrow passages, and icy cold temperatures made this an extremely tough task, a task that only a few Finnish cave divers would dare to try. Kankinen and Patrick were the most experienced members of the team. They, along with Sami Pakarinen, were the first to dive from one entrance to the other. Huterinen and Vesa had also dived in the Plura cave before, but they had never gone so deep. Yariu, new to this cave, was known for being careful and methodical. The group discussed their plan for the dive. They spent the night at Jordbru Farm, double-checking their gear and resting up for the adventure that awaited them. On the morning of February 6, with the temperature at a chilly minus 3 degrees Celsius, the team geared up for their daring adventure. The group divided their tasks, Kankinen, Vesa, and Yariu ventured to the Steinugelflagge cave with the equipment, while Patrick and Huterinen set to work cutting a hole in the ice. The duo had previously established an unofficial finish record by diving to 210 meters in the Halvala quarry. The ice was thick, but they finally broke through, uncovering crystal clear water and a breathtaking view of the pond's rocky bottom. As they geared up for the dive, Patrick and Huterinen exchanged a few words, agreeing it was time to begin. Kankinen documented the dive, showcasing the pristine water and stunning environment. They used underwater scooters to save energy as they approached the cave entrance. Each diver was a certified technical CCR full cave diver, utilizing closed circuit rebreathers instead of traditional open circuit gear. This technology allowed for longer underwater stays and easier passage through tight spaces, although it increased the inherent diving risks. Both Patrick and Huterinen, seasoned divers, entered the cave with closed circuit respirators and backup gear, prepared for a five-hour dive on February 6. Patrick Gronkvist, a firefighter and father of three, was in top physical shape, boasting 17 years of diving experience. He had explored shipwrecks and caves worldwide, even discovering a connection between the Plura and Steinugelflage caves in 2013. As the divers delved deeper into the cave, they marveled at the limestone formations and navigated narrow passageways. At the cave's deepest point, Patrick showed Huterin in a round plate and arrows he had placed during a previous exploration. After successfully switching to a backup rebreather, Patrick led the way through a tight section. When he realized Huterinen wasn't following, he went back and found his companion signaling distress. Patrick tried to help free Huterinen's tangled scooter and offered him his open-circuit bailout gas. Diving accidents often involve multiple factors, and panic can quickly worsen the situation. Drowning is a common cause of death in these accidents. Divers are trained to handle emergencies like hypercapnia and oxygen intoxication, but they can still happen without warning. Inside the cave, Hugh Terranen signaled for Patrick's open-circuit bailout gas. After switching between the two systems several times, Hugh Terranen inhaled water, and his life came to a tragic end. Patrick mourned his friend while fighting to regain his composure. Patrick's dive computer displayed a startling 400 minutes of decompression stops required for a safe ascent. The dive, 
initially planned for five hours, was now predicted to last eight or nine. Patrick understood the severity of his situation, knowing that even a minor equipment failure could be fatal. As he swam nervously towards Steinugelflagit, he worried about the fates of his fellow divers and dreaded the difficult task of informing their families about the tragedy. Meanwhile, Kankanen, Vesa, and Yariu were getting ready for their dive, following Patrick and Huterinen by two hours. They entered the water, with Vesa in the lead. Kankanen, known for his cautious nature, stayed behind to ensure their safety. Vesa, despite understanding that extra cylinders would slow them down, insisted on bringing more as a precaution. This decision led to complications when Vesa got stuck in a narrow passage and had to shed some gear. The situation worsened when his fin caught the guideline, forcing him to spend extra time at a dangerous depth. Upon reaching the deepest part of the cave, Vesa found Huterinen's lifeless body, sending the group into disarray. Vesa had to maneuver around Yari Huterinen's body. He started to remove his gear to fit through the tight space. Vesa attempted to console a distraught Yariu, he was swinging peculiarly and switched from the closed circuit system to his bailout system. He was panicking. Kankanen tried to calm him down, but moments later, Yariu was dead. Kankanen then urged Vesa to turn back, but he refused, as the way back was longer. Worried for Vasa's safety, Kankanen made the tough choice to leave him behind and turn back. As Kankanen swam back towards the entrance, he believed all his fellow divers were dead. He faced a daunting journey with limited oxygen and a series of decompression stops. Kankanen weighed the risks and opted to skip some stops to avoid depleting his oxygen. Upon reaching the air chamber, he contemplated using the trapped air to conserve oxygen, unsure how long he would need to stay there. If the others had died, no one on the surface would have known he was alive or called for help. It might take some time for rescuers to arrive since the air chamber, while close to the entrance, was still over 30 meters deep. Kankanen decided to proceed. Soon after, his underwater scooter malfunctioned, significantly slowing him down. He estimated it would take 15 minutes to reach the entrance, but it took 45 instead. Concerned about running out of oxygen, he pressed on. Low oxygen concentrations in his breathing gas could lead to hypoxia, causing unconsciousness and drowning. At the same time, Patrick was unable to surface for hours. Clinging to the cave walls, he had to choose between using his scooter's remaining battery for light or his thermal vest. It was a choice between cold and dark. Unknown to him, Vesa was making decompression stops behind him. Vesa stayed near the guideline, sometimes resting on the cave floor. He kept warm with a new undersuit, an argon inflated suit, thinsulate gloves, and wool socks. At the other end of the cave, Kai Kankanen performed his decompression stops, trying to stay comfortable. He removed extra equipment and attached it to the guideline. The cold was unbearable. He swam around to keep warm and occasionally pressed his face against the cave ceiling. When his fingers became cold, he raised his arms, allowing air inside his dry suit to warm them. Vesa felt guilty for not helping Yariu. He wondered about Gronkvist and what had happened. Hours passed. He opened the valve on his last oxygen cylinder. It was difficult to see the oxygen gauge pointer, so he wasn't sure how much was left. He tried to think of something else, his spouse and three children waiting at home. Underwater, the human body experiences pressure changes similar to a champagne bottle. When divers ascend too quickly, nitrogen in the blood forms bubbles, causing decompression sickness, or the bends, leading to severe pain, paralysis, or death. Divers must ascend slowly and make proper decompression stops to avoid these dangers. In recreational diving, the duration and maximum depth of a dive typically should not exceed 50 meters. However, Patrick, Vesa, and Kankanen pushed this rule to its limits as they swam 400 meters at depths over 100 meters, with Kankanen covering double that distance. Exhausted, low on oxygen, and with depleted rebreather filters, they could no longer perform the essential decompression stops. 
If I can make it to six meters, I'm in the clear, Patrick thought. Spotting a light below, he dove down and discovered it was Rondinen, who informed him that the others had turned back. Patrick resumed his ascent, making decompression stops until nearly the end. Patrick surfaced past nine in the evening. His dive had lasted an incredible eight and a half hours. He waited in the cave for Vesa, snacking on a vacuum-packed sausage. Vesa saw Patrick's headlamp light, signaling his presence in the cave. At three meters deep, Vasa's arms began to ache, likely a sign of decompression sickness. Patrick waited an hour before surfacing, nearly 90 minutes before it was safe. Three hours later, Kai Kankinen emerged from the cave entrance to the pond. Finding the dive hole frozen shut, he broke through the ice, pushed his gear onto the ice, and climbed out. It was 1.30 a.m., and his dive had lasted an astonishing 11.5 hours. Kankinen walked to the van and turned on the engine and lights. Patrick Gronkvist and Vesa Rontanen saw the lights and ran to the van. Kankinen, lying on the floor, spoke English, thinking he was the only one who had survived and that Patrick and Vesa were locals. He promised himself never to go underwater again. News of the deaths spread rapidly, leading to a police investigation. Patrick and Kankinen were interrogated, while Vesa received treatment in a recompression chamber in Bergen, Norway. Local officials faced a difficult choice, how to recover the bodies. They brought in three skilled British divers for the task. When they couldn't remove the bodies, the authorities decided to leave them in the cave, banning diving and closing the area. In March, a group of Finns gathered at the cave for a moment of silence in honor of Yariu and Yari Huterinen. Ten divers and seven assistants participated. Patrick Gronkvist, Kankinen, and Vesa Rontanen were determined to return for their friends. Despite anxiety and not having dived since the accident, Kankinen wished to return to Norway. Vesa volunteered to help, even though he had decompression sickness and had received treatment. The recovery operation was kept secret from the authorities. Divers would enter the cave from both entrances, leaving 26 bailout cylinders inside and an underwater habitat for rest. Ultimately, Patrick and Sammy Pokarinen succeeded in retrieving the bodies. The next morning, Sammy Pokarinen informed the authorities of their efforts. Norwegian rescue workers proceeded to transport the bodies out of the hard-to-reach cave. Even though the retrieval went against official orders, the divers did not face any backlash. In fact, local residents helped carry their gear out of the cave, and the owner of the Jordbur farm heated up the sauna for them. In late April, Patrick Gronkvist, Kai Kankinen, and Vesa Rontanen prepared themselves for a two-week cave diving expedition to Spain and France. Despite the haunting memory of the Plura accident, they resolved to press on. Almost three months had passed since the tragedy, and the victims' bodies were finally back in Finland, with the first funeral taking place earlier that day. All three divers attended the service, with Patrick even serving as a pallbearer. Later on, they would make their way to Vusari Harbor, board a ship bound for Germany, and then drive to northern Spain to explore the breathtaking Pozo Azul cave. The unforgettable and distressing experience in Plurdalen would forever be etched in the memories of Gronkvist, Kankinen, and Rontanen. Their story highlights the dangers of cave diving and the need for safety, teamwork, and readiness. Even after the tragedy, they continued diving, paying tribute to their lost friends, and exploring the depths of the earth. <laughs>